framing views in the garden as we blur the lines between inside and out. A colorful show coming up next. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. You know, usually I don't bring windows into my workshop, but I picked this up at a builder supply store to illustrate an important point. It's this idea of framing views into the garden. It's a very important garden design principle. In fact, I'm gonna take you on a trip to Charleston, South Carolina, to a garden that has very nice examples of frame views and some clever design ideas that just might inspire you. We'll also meet a window and door expert who tells us about how these elements that are a part of our homes can help us break down the barrier between inside and out. And a little later, we'll meet a daylily enthusiast who has a passion for feng shui. Hear her story, plus take home a great recipe from our kitchens. We've got a great show full of wonderful plants, inspiring gardens. There's so much to see, so stick around. I've enjoyed traveling to great cities around the country seeking out interesting private gardens, like this one in California, or take a look at this one in North Carolina, or how about this one in New York? Now I have to say that some of the gardens I've found in Charleston, South Carolina have absolutely been charming, and many of them are small, almost courtyard-like. Others are expansive, but almost all of them have some element of history associated with them. I had a chance to visit with Gene Johnson in his garden, and I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the interesting elements that he and his wife have put into place. This parterre garden is such a beautiful complement to the carriage house. Well, you know, the carriage house is really uh, the reason we bought the property. Gene, one of the most striking aspects of this garden I can see already is the way you have created an axial arrangement with this main window of, of the carriage house. Well, we were hoping to create a, a, a warm and inviting sort of uh, spot at the end of the, this axis with the pergola and the lady banks draping over it and picking up a little bit of the rhythm in the uh, luchin bench. This is the herb garden. It um, was the former site of uh, de a detached kitchen. I love the way you've done this sort of crinkle crinkle design against the wall with the boxwood and the various levels of, of uh, clipped box and colors and textures. It's beautiful. Gene, how did you become so interested in garden design? Well, I really can't use the word design as it applies to me because I never really designed anything. I can't draw. But I, what I can do is I can get out and place things, and when I see them and I like them, then I know that I've, I've, I have what I want, but it's, but it's not uh, a design. I'll just come to a, 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 a dirt feel and, and start putting things in. Yeah, so if it feels right to you in the field, out I, in the garden, then you respond to it and that then, way. And then when I, when I see it, I'll know if it's right. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of different ways, I think, to design a garden, and putting something on paper or a page is just one way, and I think the way that you're going about it is probably the most honest way. And fraught with a lot of errors. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all make mistakes, but you certainly can't tell it by the end result we've seen here today. It's really stunning. Way well, very kind. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for coming. Views like these from the Johnson's Carriage House are certainly enhanced by windows that frame the view. When we come back, we'll take a look at the importance of windows at the Garden Home Retreat. And a little later, daylilies in my garden and an interesting lesson in feng shui from a daylily enthusiast. Stay with us. You know, for me as a garden designer, I look at creating gardens like creating pictures, like painting a picture. And when you paint a picture, well, you frame it. And that's the reason I have this window here in my workshop today to illustrate the point of framing views. You see, if you create a beautiful composition outdoors, you can frame it by the various windows and doors in your home. Just take a look at this oxalis called Charmed Wine. When you take this gorgeous, rich color and you combine it with the blooms of something like this supertunia called Bordeaux, 
Well, you've really got the makings for a beautiful painting, if you will. And take this little guy. I know this little diamond frost plant is tiny, but it's one of the plants that will absolutely explode with a little summer heat and full sun. It's one of my favorite plants because of its soft, delicate, ethereal blooms, and it blooms all summer long. Now, whether you're planting in a monochromatic color theme or polychromatic, whatever you like, or whether you're planting in containers or you're filling a flower bed, the view from inside the house, to me, is very important as a designer. Tom Sinning with Marvin Windows and Doors has been consulting with me on this project, and he visited the retreat during the construction phase to check out the progress. Tom's enthusiasm for blurring the lines between inside and out is contagious. You know, my mom used to tell me that the eyes were the windows to your soul. And I really think, in growing up in this business, that the windows become the eyes to the soul of a house. Whether it's the design on the outside, like you see here, with that beautiful stone that's surrounding those windows and everything is framed, or whether you're standing on the inside and it becomes part of the frame of a beautiful living picture frame on the outside where you can look out into a garden, you can look out onto a lake, you can look out into a meadow or onto a forest or the mountains. You're really looking at part of that living, breathing earth on the outside. And that's really what windows do, is that they give you that picture from the outside. You know, with this style being an American Greek revival style, the windows that are in here, as you can see in that stone in the background, fit in very beautifully with the deep casings and the deep and the, and the narrow uh, Munt bars that are in there with the SDL bars, it really fits well into that style. And this style of windows that we're using here are the double hung style windows, which was very, very popular from the, the colonial times all the way up till now that we've used here in the United States. For the uh, summer kitchen and the studio outside here above the croquet lawn, we've used a sliding French door that opens the two center panels open up, which gives you that whole flow through from both ends and all the way through. Uh, when you're looking for uh, a product that's going to match your architectural style, and whether you're renovating or whether you're building new, you want to look for a company that doesn't just build stock windows out of a box, but they'll build windows for you that are made for that style. They can either put on the casings or they can put on the simulated divided lights that are going to match that particular style and match that particular pattern. And those are the things that you want to look at when you're really looking for something that's going to give you an accurate architectural detail. Okay, now we're going to shift from framing views to creating harmony between home and nature. We'll get some tips from a daily enthusiast with a passion for feng shui. And hey, you want to make sure you get a taste of this delicious recipe. Now what I want to talk to you about here is not a petunia, but a super tunia. Just take a look at this. What gorgeous purple blooms. That's how it got its name, Royal Velvet Super Tunia. You see, they're great for hanging baskets, window boxes, containers, and any kind of landscaping where you've got full sun. Royal Velvet's deep purple color looks great with orange, hot pink, and chartreuse. More colorful plants can be found at PLNSmith.com. As a designer and painter, I'm naturally drawn to color. Whether it's mixing flowers in the flower bed or in containers, or actually blending colors to create my own flowers, my own colors. Just take a look at some of my babies. These are some daylilies that I've hybridized. I've done this by crossing two of my favorites. So basically what I did was cross two daylily varieties, one called Jones Senior and the other Hyperion to come up with a softer yellow flower. Now speaking of daylilies, I had the pleasure of visiting the garden of Clay and Kathy Farrar, who upon purchasing the property inherited quite a daylily collection from Ted and Gloria Dameron. While I was there, the Dameron stopped by for a chat, and there I learned more about some of these daylily varieties as well as feng shui. So Gloria, what about this site really captured your imagination? Well, coming from Hawaii, I learned a lot about feng shui, and of course, this is ideal. Normally, you won't buy a house at the end of the street. However, if you do, you have to drop it down halfway, but not all the way down, and this house was perfectly situated, and the waves bring all your money and good luck to your door, as these waves that you see out here they bring it in, so yes. it's just been wonderful. Well, now, by having the house positioned lower than the road, if you're at the end of a drive, how does the feng shui work there? Well, the bad luck comes right over oh, your head. Oh, I see. And it also, goes over you. Right, and they don't like the driveways to come straight down because that might let a little trickle down, so they've curved <laughs> the driveway beautifully here. It's just perfect. 
Gloria, when you took the trees out and you opened up this lot and brought all the sunshine in, did you have any idea at that time you were going to fall in love with daylilies? No, not really. I, I did want to have some, when I went to the Garland County Fair, they had the president of the Daylily Society there giving a little lecture on daylilies, and I walked away with two free daylilies. Oh, and that's how it started. Yes, and when I saw the samples that he had, they reminded me of the hibiscus from Hawaii. Now, what are some of your favorites? Oh, some Or is it like choosing a favorite child? That's very hard, but I think my favorite one was Dina Marie, which is a nice pink with a gold pie crust. My first one was uh, Gentle Shepherd, which is a beautiful white. Creamy one. white. Yeah, it's lovely. It's fragrant. I yeah. love that one. Given this site, do you find one particular color family works better than another? Oh, yes. Uh, for this particular site, the yellows are just wonderful. They're predominant and you can see them from a mile off in the lake and my husband thinks that this this waterfront property needs to be highlighted and the yellow does it for you very nicely. <laughs> really marks the property. It certainly does. Yes. Now, if you like seeing all those colorful daylilies in this garden then you should check out my website that's pallensmith.com for tips on growing this old-fashioned favorite in your garden. I've had the great privilege of designing gardens going on, oh well, <laughs> probably some 20 years now. And it's always interesting to revisit a garden that you designed for one homeowner who has since sold it to someone else. This was the case with Catherine Rogers' garden. I was pleased to see that Catherine has continued to enjoy this garden and has added her own personal touches. The lady that owned the house before was getting elderly and so it was really pretty covered in weeds. So that was probably my biggest task was just to come in and weed everything and bring it back to life. And then I've brought in a lot of my favorite plants. So I have some plants that I've carried with me from house to house. So we've really got two gardens. We have this one which I call my cottage garden. It's just a much more relaxed garden and it's where I do a lot of cutting uh, from the garden when I want a bouquet for the house. And then in the back, uh, we have the English garden with a fountain. And that's where we love to entertain our guests. In the English garden, one thing I did, in, in the winter it looked really kind of dead. So to keep it, at least to have some form in the winter, I uh, took little English boxwoods and lined all of the, the beds with that. But truly, the bones of this garden were great when I, I bought the house, and it's one of the reasons I did buy the house, is because I could see the potential of this space. Lots of color in the garden today. We have uh, phlox, and we have lots of lilies. I did add recently a lot of hybrid tea roses, because I just love to cut them, so I've got about, oh, maybe eight varieties of new roses. I think seeing the variety of, of perennials that this garden has, it's almost exclusively perennials. So it really takes very little work. Um, other than deadheading and weeding, every year everything comes back pretty much on its own. It is the perfect size for one person to take care of. Um, I do have help with the lawn. My son comes over and mows it for me. But as far as the, the garden itself, um, it's a one-man show. My two best buddies in the garden and my constant companions while I'm out in the garden are my two dogs. I have uh, two Shih Tzus that are rescue dogs and they love being outside more than in the house, so they love it when I have a chance to come out and work in the garden. Get a taste of this delicious recipe coming up next. Well, it's just about that time of year. Time to start enjoying some of that fresh produce. Chef Peter Brave of Brave New Restaurant gives us a simple twist on making the most of some of those great tasting fresh vegetables. I'd like to demonstrate a garden salad today that's going to be topped with some lump crab meat. Let me go ahead and start off with a little bit of minced garlic right here. By chopping up too fine, what happens is a strong garlic flavor can be a little bit overwhelming. So I want to kind of rough chop that and then I'm going to use a delicious balsamic vinegar here. So uh, I want to go ahead and use about 50% of that vinegar and about 50% of the olive oil instead of a more traditional one-third vinegar, two-thirds olive oil kind of recipe. So we're going to whisk that into right here. Go ahead enough to, to blend it. Let me go ahead and season it up a little bit here. A little salt and pepper or seasoned salt if you have it. And then I'm going to set this over here. From that point, that's going to be kind of the base for our salad. And I'm going to start adding all these beautiful components from the garden. I've got some beautiful green bell peppers here. I want to go ahead and do kind of a rough cut on these. I want them all to be similar 
sizes and shapes so that they're easy to eat in the salad and they also make a nice presentation. So I've got a little green bell pepper in there, got a half of a red onion here. Put that in here. You can make this salad about an hour ahead of time and let these marinate. If you do it too much longer than that, they have a tendency to get a little bit too vinegary, so I wouldn't let it go much longer than that. Got a couple of these beautiful little fingerling potatoes. We'll go ahead and we blanched these until they were tender. Then I chilled them down. We'll go ahead and quarter them. Now, these are some of my favorite. We've got wax beans and green beans right now. Then, beautiful cucumber. I've peeled it and I've taken the seeds out of it. Go ahead and slice those up. Put those in here. Now I'm going to use one tomato in the salad. I'm going to use one tomato for the presentation. Once again, not a real fine dice. Want them to be consistent with the rest of the vegetables that are already in the salad. And that's the basis of our salad. I'm going to go ahead and toss this around. Let that vinaigrette go ahead and start to cover all of them up. And let them do their thing. They're marinating nicely now. All right, now I'm going to move to right over here. See if I can plate this up. Then I'm going to top it off with this lump crab meat. Beautiful jumbo lump crab meat. Just put a little pile of that right on top, and that's about as good a salad as you're going to have during the middle of the summer months. Hard to beat something like that. What a gorgeous flower. No wonder they call it Supertunia Bordeaux. You know, it's a great plant to have in your little box of paints for painting that picture, that garden picture that you can frame from inside the house with windows. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I have. This is all the time we have for today's show, but you can always go to my website and check out any of the information you've seen today. Everything from some of these plant varieties to that delicious recipe. And hey, if you've got some questions, just send them to pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile.